workflows um, um, with uh, developing software as well. Data Carpentry um, works with, uh, helps you with working with particular data sets. And so we have um, lessons across the board from genomics to social science. And Library Carpentry um, is, is a great way for libraries to onboard um, to, to familiar, familiar, familiarize themselves with the research data lifecycle and um, software and, and data, um, working with software and data. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, one of the things I'd like to highlight is this uh, is this uh, blog post that was written by Elaine Westbrooks, who's a university librarian at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And um, it talks about how uh, carpentries and how library carpentry can be um, this great mechanism, this, uh, this way of uh, bringing groups together on campus. So one of the things you see often um, on campus is ac in academia, but also um, in general, in organizations, is that you, you often have people come in and say, uh, we, need, we should be learning these skills, we should be training um, on this. And these acti activities happen for a while, and then they, they, they start up, and then they, they stop, and then they start up again when the new group comes in. And the library really represents this uh, continuity, this, this hub for these kind of activities. And so um, since there's a lot of activity in uh, the different uh, um, disciplines, uh, the library can be this natural hub, this connection point, using the carpentries as a way to reach out and, and, and really uh, deliver these train this training to all groups that are asking for um, software and data skills. So what these workshops encompass? Uh, they're two days, active hands-on learning, usually um, um, library carpentry is uh, looking at how we can be more flexible. Librarians um, can't get two days off sometimes, and so we're looking at how we can we can um, deliver that that content as well. Um, they're taught by trained certified instructors, so you go through a certifi certification process, and I'll I'll talk about that a little bit more um, later. Um, and then we do active feedback in the workshop, so um, you may have heard about the use of stickies that we use in these workshops and they signal if you need help or if you're fine, but you also use them for feedback. Um, and we also do this one up, one down activity to get feedback um, at the, uh, the very end of each day. Um, so it's a great way to get feedback as you're teaching and, and learn from, your, uh, from the attendees. And it's a friendly learning environment. We really value our code of conduct um, and creating that environment where people feel comfortable to learn. Um, so uh, what these workshops do, we know um, you can't learn everything in two days, um, but um, we, we, what they're great at is giving you a good start, you know, helping you feel comfortable to build the confidence in, in these skills, um, to, to really know where you're headed, you know, to, to get a jump start um, and have that positive experience to start. So you feel a little bit more comfortable on this path. Um, here is a list of our core curriculum, our lessons. So uh, you start off uh, a workshop with data intro for librarians, and it goes through data structures, regular expressions, and, and computing terms. Our, one of our favorite uh, um, activities is jargon busting, so helping people understand terms that um, they've heard and, and would like to know more about. And then Unix Shell, we do a lot of text-based um, just working with uh, uh, the command line and working with files and, and, uh, and text. And so uh, the next thing we, uh, we also do is uh, learn Git and, and for librarians, and we've started using more GitHub in the, in the training, um, but that helps you with versioning and, uh, and collaboration. Uh, and then Open Refine is one that is very popular with uh, wrangling with data and cleaning it. Um, and we're looking at new lessons. There's a lot of activity right now around new lessons around uh, FAIR um, and R and digital preservation. I was just at a workshop here in Australia that was developing that lesson further. Wikidata. Um, there are a lot. There are a lot. lot there's a lot of activity. And uh, um, this is great too. Like we have a, a report, a pilot report. The National Library of Medicine actually ran two library carpentry workshops. 
And in that report, um, the people that took the, the workshop said, I'd like to learn more after I do that standard workshop, um, I'd like to do more. And Python was one of the things that, that uh, people mentioned, um, web scraping. Um, so these are things that people would like to continue to learn. And so it's great to see that activity of uh, maintainers developing new lessons. So uh, I mentioned that uh, these lessons help build confidence. We ha have an assessment report that we do, and, and it, it demonstrates that people do really feel confident after it's one of the, the highest metrics that we have of, of success after our workshops is that people feel more confident, but they also feel like they're confident in, in reproducibility and, uh, and productivity and other, other uh, points. Um, and another uh, report that we have is looking at who's coming to our workshops. And so overwhelmingly, we have roughly between 60 and 70 percent of the attendees being early career researchers. So if you want to connect with the early career research community, this is a great way to do it. Um, there are many pathways to get involved. Um, so I, I listed two, um, but there are, there's, a, there's a Get Involved page on the Library Carpentry page which will help you um, understand the different ways you might want to get started. Uh, so one of the ways is to, to become an instructor, and that is usually um, you apply, it's free, but also you can become a member, your organization you can become a member, and more of you can go as a cohort and train together. And so the training usually encompasses two days of online training, and that training covers the pedagogy, the teaching style of the carpentries. And then you do some checkouts and demos to uh, eventually become uh, an instructor. And so these checkouts are really about demonstrating that you can contribute to our lessons, which are um, online, they're free, they're available in GitHub, and, uh, and we use the repository to collaborate. Um, so anyone actually can contribute to those lessons and find anything that we might need to change. Um, and then, um, you can request a workshop, so you can re request a two-day workshop, so library data and or software carpentry. And you can, what we do is help with the logistics and recruiting instructors, uh, instructors and, uh, and then you host the workshop. Um, just a, a note, um, it usually costs about $2,500 to run these workshops, and that covers the, um, the instructor travel. So we're a nonprofit. Um, I like to <laughs> highlight that that we're not private uh, company. We're a nonprofit. We're a community of volunteers, and um, we uh, we also I think one of the important things to to mention here is that why carpentry and uh, the reason is that carpentry is more about applied, um, more about the real world skills that you need versus um, the usual training maybe you'd get in the computer science. Uh, course, which is more theoretical. This is applied. This is the stuff you can use right away. Um, and uh, this is an overview of how big our community is. We have uh, closing in on 2,000 instructors, and we have reached all seven continents. Actually, um, not too long ago, an instructor taught a lesson in Antarctica. Um, their uh, flight was delayed, and they decided to stay for an extra two days and teach a workshop. So um, that was amazing. That was a story in nature. But we are um, growing a lot. And I think one of the things I like to highlight, too, is that one of our, uh, you know, top countries or top countries that are growing, growing carpentries is uh, they're in Africa right now. There's an African task force that's growing uh, carpentries there. So on to Kate. And I will pass the ball or Karen will pass it. Karen? Let me pass the ball to Kate. I think it's me. Yes. Great. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, I am so glad that you were here with us in spirit from Australia. Um, everyone in New England loves it that, um, that you and the, the whole carpentries work so closely with us. Kate, you're a little quiet. Um, Any better now? Excellent. Much better. Excellent. Um, so, uh, folks, I'm here to, to show you some of OpenRefine, and, and that's in the context of 
uh, discussing the Carpentry's pedagogical model um, and how it supports instructors with different opportunities to learn from each other. And that starts with instructor training when there are opportunities to practice teaching uh, during the training and to give each other feedback. Um, and then during the, the checkout as you are uh, becoming a official Carpentries instructor. Uh, you do more practice teaching there with an experienced instructor uh, to, to give feedback. And then as you go on and you teach different Carpentries workshops, uh, you're ideally, you're, you're usually, you're teaching in pairs or in groups so that you can uh, learn by observing and, and getting feedback and giving feedback and being reflective about your teaching practice. And I found that really valuable. Um, <coughs> now, before we, before we watch in the next slide our video of, um, oh, excuse me, I don't see a play button. Is this video actually going to be a video? Karen? Kate, hey, you may have to switch to um, sharing your screen. I can do that. Um, so before I share my screen and play this video for you, um, I want to give you a little context. This is a video of what not to do because you can learn from a good example and you can also learn from a horrible warning, so to speak. Um, and part of the Carpentry's way of doing things is inviting uh, feedback. And so I want to invite everyone while you're watching this um, video that I'll play in a moment to share some comments uh, just by writing into the chat box, you can see I've just posted a, a sort of content good things, content bad things, presentation good things, and presentation bad things there in the chat box. And so as this video is, is going on, you can uh, in real time send into the chat box your feedback about this presenter, uh, whom I will uh, put in front of you right now. Let's um, make this as big as we can. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Amy. I did not realize that the sound was not going to come through for you. Um, I think in this case, let's go ahead to the, excuse me, to the demonstration of um, how to teach well, and we'll skip this example of how to teach badly in this case. Um, <coughs> let's uh, let's continue sharing my my monitor actually. Uh, if we were able to effectively share this um, this demo of what not to do, you could see that there are some some mistakes that that anyone can do. You you know you're not used to teaching. You don't do it all the time. It just happens. Problems like uh, having content not appear in a way that, on the screen in a way that's easy to read, uh, using dismissive language about people who um, are here to learn something they don't know yet, but but that doesn't mean that they're, they're stupid or ignorant. It means that they, they have a plan to learn some new things. Um, using too much advanced terminology during a talk, that's a, a common problem that you can avoid. Um, speaking too fast or, or not explaining what the purpose of the lesson is. All of these are problems that Carpentry's instructors are trained to avoid. Um, so after I do some, some demo teaching with Open Refine, uh, you can give me some feedback and tell me how well I've done, too. <laughs> so, moving on to our demo, and I think that right now you can still see my screen. Right now it's got Open Refine uh, up in it in this Create Project view. Um, and if there's any, maybe I can look at the chat at the same time. Good. So we're, we're looking at this um, live demo of Open Refine. Um, <coughs> So first of all, I'm going to uh, import some data into OpenRefine, and you can import it from your computer, but I'm actually going to get it from 
um, the the library carpentry demo at, at this um, uh, on GitHub for us. So I'll start loading this data. And here I've got some options to choose exactly how I want Open or Find to import this uh, CSV that I just asked it to get for me. So I'll set up the character encoding here. Um, I like all of the selections that are, are here uh, because I do have column headers in the CSV. If I, if I unclick that, you can see the, the live update. Now the first row is, is being considered data, which is not actually what I want. So I'll keep that, excuse me, keep that parse next one lines as column headers checked. And now I'll create the project. And so here's my project. It's pretty big, right? A thousand and one rows, but I am only showing 10 of them right now. And I can change that here if I want to. Um, the, the really important parts of the Open Refine interface are here on the left, where I've got this facet and filter tool and this undo and redo tool. Um, the undo and redo is really nice, not just for backtracking, which we all have to do sometimes, uh, but it's also great for reproducibility. If you've done some data cleaning, you can uh, navigate to this history here and then extract all of the steps that you applied when you were doing some data cleaning in, in Open Refine, and you can extract them um, using this button here as, as JSON. And then you can apply that sequence in other projects, or you can share that sequence so other people know what you did. <coughs> Back to faceting and filtering. Um, here's an example of how that's useful. Let's say that I, um, I'll look at this language column here, and I see that there's both English and EN, and that's just within the first 10, within other records in these, um, you know, thousand, thousand records, there may be some other languages too. Um, so if I do language and then facet and text facet, now I can see all of the different values that show up within that column in different, in different parts. Um, and if I think, you know, the, the EN and the English, I, I really want those to be the same thing. Um, and I think I'd, I want to change English to EN rather than changing EN to English so that things sort of match with our, our short abbreviations here. So I'll just go to Edit, and I'll change that to EN, and Apply. And then this uh, language text facet has updated. Um, I no longer have any uh, rows with English as the value in the language column. Now it's all EN, and, and that update happened uh, really easily. Um, that's one example of data cleaning in Open Refine, but it gets better. Uh, for example, I can do some data cleaning even with multi-valued cells, like these author cells here. Um, I can uh, split one of these multi-value cells, right, edit cells and then split multi-valued cells. The separator that was used in this data set is the pipe here. So I'll change that separator. And now you can see I've got um, a lot more rows than I used to. If I switch to this records view, I can see that I still have 100 and, uh, excuse me, 1,001 records, but many of the records now fill more than one row because there was more than one author included in the, in the record. And originally they were separated by this pipe, but now they're all in their own row. So I can interact with them, maybe I can do some modifications or cleaning, and then later on I can put them back together. So let's look at the authors and I will, um, I'm gonna do some clustering so I can have open refine algorithmically group together values that are similar, but they're, they're similar but inconsistent. And then I can merge them into a single value. So um, I'll click on authors and then I'll edit these cells. And um, then I want to cluster and edit. 
and then I have these options. For right now, I'll, I'll keep this key collision and, and fingerprint under method and keying function. Um, and I can see that the different versions of similar author names like Chandra Naveen and Naveen Chandra, um, OpenRefine is suggesting to me that maybe these um, maybe these combinations actually represent one underlying uh, author in this case. And I can look through them individually and make some changes, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the, the suggestions that OpenRefine is making in this case, so I'm just going to click Select All, and then Merge Selected, and Recluster. And there's no new clusters, but if I change the keying function or the method, OpenRefine uses a different algorithm and finds some new potential clusters. Um, and, you know, some of these look like they are probably truly clusters, uh, like this one, and probably this one, uh, maybe even this one. But, you know, I'm not sure if Srinivastava and Srinivast, maybe those are two different family names. Um, Feng Yan and Feng Yang, I think that those might actually be some separate names. So maybe for this iteration, where I used the different keying function. Um, maybe I don't want to select them all and cluster them all. Maybe I'll just take these ones that I'm happy with and do that clustering. And then eventually when I'm happy with all the different clustering algorithms that I could apply, um, I can close this. And now I'll come back and I'll say I've done my cleaning of the author's uh, data and now I want to put everything back together. Um, so I'll go back to authors, and I'll edit the cells, and then I'll join them. And I think that I'd like to keep using that pipe that we had as a separator before. So I'll put in a pipe here. And now our authors are back together, but many of the names that were written slightly differently when I started, now they've been adjusted, so this data is a little bit cleaner. <coughs> After you've done some cleaning and you want to get your data out of OpenRefine, I'm just going to move our chat window down here, uh, I can export the, the data that I've cleaned here. Um, and I have options I can export in different formats. Um, I can choose which columns I want to export. Um, so I have a lot of flexibility in that context. Now, I'm going to show you one more uh, snazzy open refine tool and uh, or application, I suppose. And this is reconciliation. And for this, I'm going to start a new project. Um, so I'll come back to open refine here. And I'm going to import some data from a website. And I'm happy with how all this looks, so I'll create my project. Maybe I'll give things a new name first. Um, I'll call it the NNLM NER demo. And I'll create this project. And so I've just got a very basic uh, table here with, uh, there's only one column, right? Just that, well, I suppose I have these numbers, but I have these authors, right? And so, I'm going to connect to Wikidata so I can get some information about these authors from this reliable source. Here's how. Uh, for this column, I'll go down to Reconcile, start reconciling, and I've got Wikidata here. When it lets me choose um, what kind of uh, type I want to reconcile with. I'm going to look at humans because um, all my authors are indeed human. And I'll start reconciling. Behind the scenes, OpenRefine is going to Wikidata and is looking for uh, relevant information for humans that, that have these names that I have in my, in my table. Um, and I can see that for some of the records, like Maya Angelou and Octavia Butler, 
um, open, refine, and Wikidata together, they, they're working well. They just found one um, human who is associated with this author name. But for, for record 10 and record 2, I have lots of choices here. So this is a nice uh, feature of the, the reconciliation of Wikidata and OpenRefine. I can check and see, you know, okay, this is James Baldwin, American writer, that's who I expected. This second, James Mark Baldwin, I can see why Wikidata was saying, oh, maybe this is what you wanted, but, but actually, um, this is supposed to be my list of African American authors. So it was this first James Baldwin that I was actually interested in. So I'm going to select James Baldwin. And then for Richard Wright, let's check through um, Richard Wright, the keyboardist of Pink Floyd. Probably very interesting, but not useful for my list of African American authors. Here we go. This Richard Wright is the Wright Richard Wright. So now I've, um, I've selected which of the uh, reconciliations I want here. And now I can add some information. So I'll come back here for my whole column. And I'm going to choose, excuse me, I'm going to choose edit column. Um, and then I want to add columns from reconciled values. And then let's say that I do the, the place of birth and the place of death. And I can see in this preview what it's going to, to show up. Excellent. Um, now, of course, this can only provide information if Wikidata knows that information. And so um, if I just show all 11 rows in my in my uh, table instead of stopping at 12. I can see that for, for Toni Morrison, there's a place of birth, but uh, for obvious reasons, there's no place of death here. Um, but this has allowed me to continue building up my table of information about African American authors with data from Wikidata, and I didn't have to do it by hand. I could do it all through this process of uh, reconciliation. Uh, one of the many nice features of OpenRefine. So now I can export this. Uh, let's just look at a HTML table so that it's um, easy for us all to see. And now I have this nice table that has all of the um, names that I started off with, but now it's got these um, this added information about the place of birth and place of death uh, that I got from Wikidata thanks to reconciliation. So that was a whirlwind tour of OpenRefine and how it can be useful for cleaning and manipulating data. Um, if we had been uh, working in a sort of real Carpentries workshop, there would have been a lot more um, hands-on practice and there would be uh, helpers available to, to troubleshoot issues that, that come up on the um, they, they come up when you're doing some hands-on practice or exploring the topic. Um, I encourage you to come to a Carpentries workshop. And indeed, if I switch back to the slides, let's um, stop sharing. So we'll come back to our slides. And we'll move on to um, to our library carpentry demo. You can see the whole lesson that I drew some of these examples from um, at this link here to uh, lc-open-refine. Uh, um, you can get a sort of quick summary of what you would learn in the Open Refine uh, workshop at, at the second link here, and um, and that's Open Refine brought to you through the wonders of Library Carpentry. Um, now, I see there's a question in the chat. And I also want to encourage people, you know, I really do uh, invite you to share your feedback. This content plus content minus presentation plus presentation minus um, 
put it in the chat, or of course, I think Karen will be sending out some uh, some feedback for the whole webinar later. But but that's a, an important part of the library carpentry and and uh, software carpentry ethos to invite feedback. So so please don't be shy. And while you're pasting uh, that or writing that into the chat, um, I'll pass the baton to Julie so she can tell you all about NestClick. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Open Refine is pure magic. You can see all the awesome things that you can that you can really do with it. Um, so we saw some facet filter and um, awesome stuff. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, some background information and how Netflix got started, which is the New England Software Carpentry Library Consortium, the mouthful. Um, and again, I'm the Research Data Services Librarian um, located at Harvard. Um, so we're really creating a community of practice, and that's kind of what we do best here in New England, um, getting people together around um, <laughs> these topics. Um, and we have so many active data librarians here, and some of them identified the need for additional reproducible research computational skills and wanted the opportunity to become part of the growing carpentry community as certified instructors. So the first year was really an experiment, and we wanted to address these three questions. Could we bring together institutional contributors and the staff time of already busy professionals to increase the number of available carpentry instructors in the region? Who at our institutions would want this training? and what would be the benefit to our institution. So we know the cost of carpentry membership um, was kind of expensive to our institutions individually, and there was a long wait list for instructor training for non-members at the time. So therefore, we contacted Software Carpentry Membership Director to see if we could pursue a consortium membership model to receive the membership benefits as a group. Uh, once we established that Software Carpentry would let us pilot this for um, at least one year, we reached, we reached out to our colleagues to, to, um, who had expressed interest um, to see if they would be willing to join. Um, and I, I keep saying Software Carpentry um, because, as you heard from Chris, uh, the carpentries, as um, it is now officially been formed, hadn't really been formed quite yet, so it was still really known as software carpentry, um, not this um, big umbrella um, organization um, as it is now. Um, so the first cohort of participants consisted of 15 staff members from library and information technology organizations at seven higher ed institutions. Prior to joining um, Netflix, a few participants had been part of a software data or library carpentry workshop, but none had been officially trained as instructors. And as you can see from the map, um, we have members from across New England. And Netflix has also worked with NEASIS and the NNLM NER to support the participation of librarians from across New England in the most recent workshops by either hosting or offering travel stipends, really encouraging the whole region um, to participate. Um, so this is kind of a breakdown of how Netflix shares the costs and benefits that go along with gold tier membership. But the consortium also allows staff from the different areas of academic librarianship and technology, including the digital humanities, statistics, high-performance computing, sciences, engineering, medical libraries, and data services to work together on Carpentry's initiatives in their libraries. Sharing the membership between the seven libraries have allowed Netflix members to pilot the Carpentry's approach together rather than separately and to lower the cost for each institution. We've developed a Memorandum of Understanding, a vision statement, letters of intent, and other administrative documentation. This was an important step. 
completed by members of our executive committee, which established a shared understanding of our roles and responsibilities. So we all went through um, the Carpentries Instructor Training, which we really called a two-day reflective boot camp. Um, an important component of the training sessions is to complete them with your peers in a room for feedback on teaching practice sessions and discussion of the lesson materials. Um, this involves learning the teaching concepts of software carpentry, not the actual mechanisms of coding. Um, so the instructor training doesn't itself teach you to necessarily code, but teach carpentry lessons using best practices. It focuses on theory and practice. Learning through live coding is active learning and allows for formative assessment. Um, the carpentry community really is one, which um, Chris really talked about, uh, with regular calls. Um, are available to um, discuss instruction plans and experiences, um, lively communities for developing new lessons um, and improving existing materials, assessment, um, and governance. And you can see the example of the wonderful certificate that you get um, when you become official instructor. Um, you really do feel like you've accomplished something and you become a part of this um, awesome community. Um, so these are just um, some of the examples of the activities that we um, provide the opportunity for our members to, to do. Um, so develop instructional materials and contribute back to this awesome community. Um, be a part of a network of data fluent researchers and instructors. Refine your skills by participating as instructors and in other member institutions or at other member institutions and learn new skills and improve on existing ones. Um, and the picture you see is from a library carpentry workshop, which was um, held back in October at Brown University, which um, Yeezus helped sponsor. And so we have a um, GitHub hosted website, which was developed to market and capture the activities of our consortium. It includes information about our members, publications and presentations, the workshops we've hosted and been involved in, um, and the Carpentries organization in general. Um, so during the first year of the consortium, um, which was from October 2017 to October 2018, um, our members served as hosts, instructors, and helpers in um, nine workshops across New England reaching over uh, 250 librarians and scholars. So you can find our upcoming workshops um, that our member institutions are hosting or um, are involved in listed on our website by going to that link. Um, so we really wanted to highlight the constant feedback um, that our members, that you really get um, in the Carpentry Workshop. So Chris mentioned the use of stickies in the Carpentry Workshop. Um, and we really wanted to highlight this constant feedback and improvement mechanism that is built into the Carpentry's methodology for both learners um, and instructors. So having students record this one up, one down reflection from a lesson or workshop can be helpful for them to take away what they learned or enjoyed about the teaching, teaching interactions or what they still are struggling with or dislike about the teaching format. Um, the comments are also constructive for instructors to improve their own teaching skills and workshop layout um, and also be used to report back to the carpentries about lesson topics, concepts, or exercises. Um, so here we included um, some real life feedback that um, we got from that. Um, Brown University workshop that I mentioned that um, Neasis um, helped sponsor. Um, and if you're not familiar with Neasis, it's the New England chapter for the Association for Information Science and Technology. Um, so Netflix has quickly established itself in the region and continues to grow further 
um, across New England. Um, and Chris has told me that um, a group in New York is modeling after us, so that's awesome to hear that um, you know this is spreading. Um, moving forward, Netflix plans to extend their membership to other academic institutions and help onboard additional certified instructors. We have already recruited our second cohort. That's awesome. And they'll be going through the instructor training workshop next week. So we also want to keep our alumni involved um, by doing, you know, webinars like this. So um, it's great that Kate and I can be here. Um, run more library carpentries workshops. So getting involved in the library carpentry community with Chris is um, our goal. And then also develop a new curriculum. And we've already started doing that um, in the digital humanities um, at Yale and then um, the biodiversity area um, at Harvard. Sorry, and I did not advance the slides for what I just said. I apologize. Um, so that's um, for our goals and updates on moving forward. And the picture highlighted here is from our Carpentries Instructor Training, which was held um, in two different locations, one also at Brown University, but then also um, at UMass Amherst Library. So I do encourage, um, if you are interested in getting involved, please learn how the instructors are staying um, involved in the consortium, building their own carpentry skills, giving back to their communities, and collaborating around New England. You can visit our website, visit our GitHub site, um, email the group if you are interested in joining you know, a future cohort um, or getting us to come to your institution to do um, a workshop. We are very interested in partnering with you or working with you. Um, and then you could also find upcoming, if you are not in New England, um, as Chris mentioned, there are workshops happening across the world. Um, so uh, no matter where you are, you can find an upcoming library carpentry or any kind of carpentry workshop. Um, so you can find those on the library carpentry uh, website. And then, of course, there are many outlets to getting connected with the Carpentries and Library Carpentry specifically. Um, I'm not going to list all these ways, but specifically Twitter, um, or getting on GitHub, or joining a mailing list, um, contacting Chris directly, um, many different ways to get involved. Um, and I think that leaves us about um, 10 minutes or so. Um, for questions or discussion. Um, I haven't even been looking at the chat box. It um, um, looks like there have been some questions. Um, but please um, let us know if you have want to know more. I just want to give a special shout out. Thank you so much, Chris, Kate, and Julie. You did an excellent job. I really can't wait um, to go through all through this. And it looks like we had some really great questions um, that are in the chat box that are um, so far looks like they've been answered. But um, and I'm trying to figure out how to unmute everybody. But if there's a pro if if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I think maybe I can do it individually. Um, just, there's a little hand button under your name under participant. Um, I can unmute you that way if you'd like to speak. And but like I said, thank you very much. It's been very informative. And we've also seen some interesting discussion in the the chat box. Um, in particular, um, Paul. Oh dear, Paul and Andrea have been. Um, asking in the chat about the applications of, of some of these tools. Um, I'll just from my personal experience, I'll tell you that as as fun as it is to sort of see new information appear as we did with reconciliation. To be honest, I do use the clustering that I demonstrated more in my in my everyday professional life. Um, 
but that's uh, with Opener Find and with all the tools that are discussed in the library carpentry workshops and also the software and data carpentry workshops, um, you, you can learn some basics and then you can think about how you want to apply these tools in your workflow and uh, in your local context. So a lot of these tools can really be flexible and what's a, a valuable um, reconciliation application for, for one person might be a curiosity that they bring out for show and tell uh, for another person. And it's the strength of the carpentries, I think, that it's, it's so broadly applicable um, for different use cases. We have a question. Um, I have it uh, from Andrea. I've attended this workshop with ideas that I could apply these tools to creating a scholarly activity repository for our doctors affiliated with our institution, the hospital. And I had trouble in the past with disambiguation and incomplete data about authors in PubMed mainly. Any thoughts on where we should go to start figuring that out? I, I can start. Um, <laughs> I, it's great that we have this tool, this hand tool. This is actually what we do in our, our carpentry staff meetings. Is we type in hand in our in the chat so that people can um, speak. And so um, yeah, that that's a, that's a good question. One of the other um, um, one of the other connections that we uh, didn't show, um, and and there are there are other ones uh, besides the wiki data. Is that there there was one for orchid. Um, and uh, that could put, put a, potentially help you with the disambiguation, the, di the disambiguation problem you're having with uh, PubMed or want to try. Um, so that that might be an option. Um, but there are also um, other services, as I as I said. Um, and you, so besides using the reconciliation service, you can also um, use the API uh, option, working with an API and grabbing data that way. Um, but I know other institutions have actually uh, taken our workshop. Uh, so we've had um, like other instances where um, libraries and like the broad spectrum of people in a library um, have taken a class. And um, some of the people there have said, oh, we can create our own reconciliation service locally for doing curation work that we want to do. And so there have, I've, I've seen conversations around creating that for the specific work that organizations do. I hope that answers your question. That oh, and that put in uh, yeah, in, in GitHub link. Talk yeah, Kate uh, handed some other links. That's that's great. <laughs> Of course, there's no link in the world that can get all of the clinicians in your hospital to actually sign up for ORCIDs and start using them, which is, you know, sort of a prerequisite for, <laughs> for these tools to be useful. I also just wanted to, uh, um, um, I included the link to the slides um, earlier on, um, and uh, um, if you can, watch the video that um, that Kate uh, um, mentioned earlier, um, <laughs> you'll really see uh, an example of some of the things that, um, you know, we look at when we're doing the instructor training to look at examples of, of uh, of what to do and what not to do. And uh, um, that particular example, I think, is uh, someone rushing through the lesson. And that's a common mistake uh, that I think uh, instructors make is trying to cover all the material all, all at once. And so um, that, that's, a, that's just one of the lessons that we learn to try and um, help with our teaching, our teaching style. Um, so yeah, please have a look at that video later. And I think Julie wants to talk here. No, I'll just second that. Um, yeah, that video is really fun to watch. <laughs> and and I'll I'll agree for sure and say that. 
the Carpentries instructor training was useful for me in my teaching practice, and, and I like to think that I am uh, a pretty good teacher. I, I taught for five years before I became a librarian. Um, I have different certifications in that, and, and I still learn some, uh, some new um, some new theory and, and evidence and, and useful tips and tricks. So I can't say enough good things about the instructor training that Software Carpentries does. We've, we've also had some other interesting paths with our um, instructors or soon to be instructors is that they've started off, um, sometimes people start off as helpers, but um, well, often they do. But um, the, other, the other thing is we, we have maintainers for our lessons that are um, learning about the carpentries, they've learned about it, um, but they haven't taken the instructor training and, and started taking it now. Um, so we have like multiple pathways into the, into uh, the, the carpentries, into library carpentry. Uh, so um, that's another thing to look at that get involved um, page and find the various ways that you might want to get involved. There's so many different ways. So I just posted the link, I believe, to the video in the YouTube, um, in, in the chat box, if you guys would like to see that on your own. And um, so, but I just want to wrap up and just thank you again, everyone. Um, this has been very informative, and I do have to say, if you have a chance to take a library carpentry class, it was very informative. I went to the brown one that was actually pictured in Julie's slides. Um, I was in the back, so it was really informative, and I really do value the fact that they put the the, the sticky notes up with the red and the green, where red if there's a problem, and green if you're okay. And I always found that it was very helpful if something crazy was going on, like I found I had a firewall issue, and so I couldn't get open get the software to work the right way until I had to log out and go through a whole different computer. So it was very interesting. But thank you very much. Um, if there's any other questions, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, please feel free to email. Um, and starting on Monday, um, if you've taken any of the RDM classes, we are starting a new forum. So instead of having a follow-up webinar, we are now going to have a forum where you can ask questions of other colleagues who have taken the RDM classes. And we actually are um, just started our RDM 102 class, and there'll be another one, I believe, in the fall, starting with 101, and so keep an eye out for that. And there should be another webinar in uh, two months. I'm not, right now I'm blanking on the date. I believe April, Thursday, in April, the first Thursday in April at 2 p.m. And thank you again for your speakers. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys had fun and learned something. <laughs>